This is the Blackout Podcast. Welcome to the Blackout Podcast, where I get to talk to amazing people doing mm-hmm. amazing things. And I'm excited to finally get Lindsay on <laughs> today. I've uh, been trying to make this happen, but you've been busy with the flotation center mm-hmm. and all the many things you do. And you're busy too. By <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm super happy you're here today. I'm really happy too. Thank you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I try to start with that uh, so I get time to drink my water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like I've got to hydrate. So tell me more about yourself. Mm. But, uh, let's see. Um, Born and raised in Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. So I'm actually from no- I'm from here. Um, and I had a pretty rural lifestyle growing up. More cows than people from where I'm at. Um, I went to SMU and I did uh, forensics. And then I switched to engineering. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when growing up, I wanted to be a coroner. I was like, I wanted to be a forensic pathologist. I, was, I wanted to go into medicine because I was really fascinated with uh, like, dead bodies. And death. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but but here's, the, here's the thing. And I think that once I got to SMU, everyone you know who's in science is like, I'm pre-med, I'm pre-med. And so I was like, I'm probably not smart enough oops, to do that. So uh, I switched engineering. And then I went to UBC and I lived in Vancouver for eight years and I finished my engineering degree there. And then about five years ago, I moved back here and um, life kind of just took me completely sideways and no more engineering. Mm. And then I opened the flotation center. So how was the eight years in BC? Um, It's interesting because uh, when I was living in Halifax, I've felt the city like was too small for me at the time. I was like, you know what? I can, um, I know a lot of the people I've, I've made it here and that like I was ready to explore more. Mm. But once I got to BC, I really quickly um, realized that it was not going to be a forever place for me. Vancouver was too big. Um, But the first like two years I was there, I must have spent thousands of dollars in concert tickets because there's so many <laughs> bands that go to Vancouver to play there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But never ever like they go to Montreal and then, then they dip down into the States. So yeah. um, I really made the most of my, <laughs> my time and my student loan money there. But then, and then I, I didn't plan on staying, but then okay. I got married and I stayed there. Uh, yeah, did I, you marry in BC? Yeah, I got married okay. in BC. And my ex-husband, um, he's from there. So, um, and was an engineer. So we didn't really, like, I always wanted to come back here eventually, but um, there, you know, making a a decent, like, salary, and there was so many plentiful jobs and stuff at the time Mm. that it was was very easy to stay. But then we split, and I was really ready to come back to Nova Scotia. But I gave myself a year to, like, have a good think about, you know, don't be knee-jerk, you just got divorced, don't come back right away. Mm. And... But within that year, there were a lot of signs that were like, Lindsay, you have to get out of Vancouver. What are some of the signs? Um, I had six people in my life pass away suddenly, like from my best friend to my favorite aunt, my favorite uncle. Um, you know that uh, Einstein definition of insa- insanity, of like doing the same thing over. So I was really trying to make engineering work for me, but I was miserable at it. What kind of engineering like, did you do? Um, it was chemical environmental. So oh. I did, it's chemical engineering, but with environmental concentration. But really looking back, I probably should have just done like environmental engineering chemicals very laced with the um uh, oil and gas industry yeah. so and that's something that i was very opposed to yeah um so anyway but then a yeah. lot of people will say but the money though oh yeah yeah <laughs> you know what like um so i had a pretty sweet gig where i i did fly to fort mcmurray mm. i worked for two weeks and then i they flew me back to vancouver and then i was off for two weeks mm. so first i only worked six months of the year but i worked two weeks straight 12 hour days gotcha but i made seventy thousand dollars a year but only working six months mm. so it was a it was a pretty good gig but the money wasn't worth it ultimately in the end and it wasn't yeah. what i wanted to do yeah. so um so i still though i was like i'm gonna make i'm gonna try this company and i'm not happy well i'm gonna try maybe working over here but really what it was was the actual industry that i wasn't yeah feeling fulfilled and satisfied with so yeah. but um yeah so um i actually moved back 
to Halifax for a job, like for an engineering consulting job that probably like, I think I had just packed up one of those moving pods and sent it across the country. And then I get a call saying, we don't have a job for you. Wow. <laughs> the contract fell through. So um, I still moved back because mm. I had to. And then um, fortunately, though, I was able to get on EI. And that gave me some time to think about like what I really wanted to do. And um, one of my main reasons for going into like engineering was I wanted to it was my environmental background. Um, I would say I definitely was an environmentalist. Mm. Uh, and so I just wanted to help people and do something that was like helping the earth and like the, the bigger picture. Mm. And uh, engineering was not that for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then what happened was, so was uh, floating came along and meditation, having a meditation practice like saved my life. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought like, is there a sneaky way to get people to meditate? But floating was the key. Like floating is it because people will come up from their float being like, oh my gosh, I think I just meditated. I've never done it before. But then they'll come back saying, so you know when I floated? Now I've taken that meditation practice home and then they're continuing with it. So mm. I just realized that I wanted to do good work, but it feels better on a more one-to-one -one level as opposed to... Um, creating bylaws that are going to protect our streams which is very good work but it was going to take me years and years of work to see any change mm -hmm. uh, or positive influence whereas this is <laughs> this hits my uh, dopamine receptors very quickly <laughs> <laughs> which is good because i can be impatient sometimes <laughs> i don't mean to be but i can be <laughs> yeah. yeah so um <laughs> and then so you the divorce happened you moved well then you got this job that fell through but you yeah. moved back how long were you in Halifax before you decided like did you float before yeah yeah starting your own center how yeah. did that happen um so for my birthday of seven or eight years ago I was gifted a float and uh, I really enjoyed it it was terrifying at first mm. um, like they were like here's the earplugs, don't get the water in your eyes. And that was it. There was no preamble walk through to make you feel cozy. Excuse me. And uh, it was, so it was something that stuck out, but it wasn't something that, um, I didn't think that was like a point in my life that, that things were going to change. Mm -hmm. It was just like, wow, that was a really profound experience. Okay. Uh, and then when I was living in Halifax, I was like, I, you know, I need to float. I need to, to, think about what do I want to do and I found that the closest float space was in Montreal about 13 hours away so I was like nope that's not gonna happen <laughs> so I think I moved here in October 2013 and we opened up in May okay. 2015 so like a year and a half ish later or something so it happened very, very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. I saw the pictures where you were in, like, with your big ass hammer. I know. Yeah. So they were going to charge $8,000 to demo the place. <laughs> I was like, I am saving $8,000 and I'm just going to knock down the walls myself. <laughs> <laughs> How was that process? The war made you, I mean, weren't you, well, you're an engineer, but still, weren't you worried some might go off? Uh, no, because, so that's the thing too, is that, you know, go to the electrical panel and I just shut everything off anyway. But I still have a picture probably on my phone of the first hole I put into the wall as well. <laughs> yeah. It felt really good. It felt like, Rawr, like kind of like, yeah, Shira, He-Man, like, but it, it was great because it was actually like my dad, my uncles and my cousin and my partner all came out and we just, you know, grabbed some pizza and stuff and knocked mm. down the walls and, I'm sure there's probably a metaphor in there somewhere. <laughs> how, how long did it take to do a that? A day. Oh, yeah, it was wow. Just a day. But then um, lots of like chipping the tiles and stuff off the floor. So, yeah. It, but in total, so we started the demolition process uh, mid-February 2015 and opened up May 8th. So it took us, oh, you know, yeah. uh, I guess was that March? Almost three months to do the whole thing. So um, here's the thing, though. Did you need to get any permits to do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And okay. because I'm the total, like, nerdy engineer, <laughs> I was like, I've got my permits, and I have them, like, nailed to the wall so that everyone <laughs> can see them. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they probably walked in, like, the, my construction team probably walked in and was like, you are such a friggin' nerd. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so the walk in. Um, what was the first thing you remember them putting in the building? Uh, so once we tore down the walls, we had to do a lot of draining and stuff too. So putting in some drainage for the float tanks in case there was a flood. Um, but what really sticks out to me is that after once the walls got were were studded and 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 they were starting to put it up, that I was like, holy smokes, like this place didn't exist mm. as it does now mm -hmm. you know and it there's some like even now when i lock up or, or i open the door um our lock has a really good like click to it like it resonates and you just click it and it's always a reminder that at the end of the day that when i lock that door i'm like wow this place didn't exist mm. and now it does and it's funny how something so simple you know can make you think mm. about that sort of thing yeah. that it but it does for me. <laughs> well, you started, how many times were you in there? Uh, so we started with two. And mm -hmm. then May 2016, we added a third tank. So we were at capacity. We were booked about 100% of the time, almost two to three weeks out. So, which is great because when you're a new business, you're yeah. shitting your pants yep. just like, I am going to mess this up and, and you know, I can't believe I left engineering, which no, I can believe I left engineering, but like mm. you've got all these worries and stuff, but um, we just have done like a really good job of being very honest about the floating and the process and stuff that people can connect. And if they're curious, I find that just something little that we may say, mm. it, 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 uh, it's enough for them to be like, hey, you know what I was thinking about this? Now I'm going to. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's it's great. We always, like, welcome, you know, a ton of new people into our space and stuff. And I love it because I get really excited when new people come in to float. Yeah. Because <laughs> I really feel like I'm very good at at what I do. Like, because I, I, I don't lie to people about the experience. I'll, you know, and I just find that I... Um, can get on can get on the level where someone is at and just listen to what they have to say and why they're coming into float and yeah. but then I also do get genuinely excited for them so mm. they probably have their nerves like eased a little bit because they realize that it's not just a stuffy environment of like here's some earplugs <laughs> water in your eyes right <laughs> have fun <laughs> get naked <laughs> um so then um oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, let's run a little bit Certainly. so before before you actually started out how do you fund the place um well so with a lot of like financing for businesses and stuff mm. um they want to see that you're putting in a third of what that uh loan program is going to give you so um, being an engineer, I had about eighteen thousand dollars of uh, RSPs. Yeah, RSPs. Yeah, I was like RSVPs, RSPs <laughs> saved up. So I just took my retirement savings yeah. and could show like so credit union, BDC, a COA, futurepreneur, be like, yeah, I've got twenty thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, I've got twenty thousand dollars. Here we go. Um, I was my it's funny my biggest concern with the whole project was that they were going to see that I have a ton of student loans left like I started with about $75,000 of student loans and now I'm down to about 40,000 but I still thought that they were going to be like hm, yeah no. not going to happen yeah. good luck but um it worked out fine yeah and like the hardest part wasn't the financing was more the HR or whatever oh, oh, yeah oh, oh, oh. And then also what's kind of really cool in our uh, province is that we have a equity tax credit program. And what that is is that friends and family can can invest into your business through this tax credit program. Mm. And they get back on their income taxes their very first year, 35% of their investment. Oh, wow. Which is crazy, right? So it's mostly for people who like – want to just support your business, put the mm. money into it. And they're not expecting a big return right away. Yeah, yeah. But they're like, oh my gosh, I put in ten thousand dollars and I'm getting yeah. back thirty five hundred. Like that never happens. Like yeah. It's not a big you know, that that never happens. So I got lucky in that I had some family members and a couple friends who also wanted to invest into mm. the business too. So that um that definitely, it's not like I'm dishonest and that I do shady business practices, but it definitely like makes me, I always am thinking that I've got other people who 
I am caring for, making business decisions on their behalf. Same with having staff as well. Yeah, too. yeah. So, uh, yeah. did you start out with staff right away? Yeah, I had to. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I I know my I know my limits. So we were open six days a week. And Holy smokes! It was myself and Palmer, who he's still with me. So I think we might have been closed on Mondays. Monday was like maintenance day where we do our deep clean and chain, you know, fix this and do whatever. Mm. Um, and then after being open for about six or seven months, we hired a third person who was just doing, you know, one or two shifts a week. But uh, now behind the desk, there's myself and uh, four other people. Wow. And we're open seven days a week from... Most days, like, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., too. So, oh, wow. And then there's also uh, 10 practitioners that work out of the space as well. Yeah, too. that one, yeah. that's kind of new, right? Like, um, relatively? Well, we started with it, but it's only, it's taken a while to grow our wellness side of things. I mean, there's so many places in, in Halifax that are wellness centers and clinics, and we have a really amazing population of, like, massage therapists. So it takes... And it's such a personal thing, too, so that you got to find the person, person you like. Yep, yep. And now, though, like, just the people who come in, there, like, they only want to see Virgil or they only want to see Lori, you know, and that, and so that feels really good as well. So with the practitioners, is it, um, hmm, how does that, uh, is it, like, flotation or are they... Uh, They're just like, completely separate from... Oh, 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 Yeah, oh, okay. so, though, like, the flotation center is... Floating primarily, however, uh, we host these independent contractors. I still, I mean, we t- treat them as like a team and employees and gotcha, stuff, even gotcha, though they're gotcha, not. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, but we also do as many things as collaboratively as possible too. Mm. So, you know, um, I have a massage therapist who who uh, loves treating women who are pregnant, and floating is really good for women who are pregnant as well. So mm. we do like. We work together with stuff like that. So this well. floating thing, <laughs> what? Uh, so. D- Walk me through it. The tank is contains what water? Water. So, <clears throat> a flotation therapy tank yeah. is. No, <laughs> it's a well engineered but enclosed tub. Is the easiest way to explain it. So it's the size of a small car. Like our tanks are eight and a half feet long by four and a half feet wide. Oh. And their boat is. Um, when I stand up, they're like that tall, so you can sit right up in them. Mm. And then there's about 11 inches of water with 1,000 pounds of Epsom salts dissolved in it. So when you get into the float tank and then you lay back, you just float. So when you're in there, there's no sights or sounds or smells. And since the temperature of the water is the same as your skin surface, after a while, you can't tell where the water and air in your body begins and ends. And you lose all kind of perception. Like it feels like you're floating in space. Oh, wow. It really feels like... You are just suspended and there's no um, like hard pressure points on your body. Mm. So what happens when you're in there is that like your body actually elongates a bit, like up to a quarter of an inch. Oh, wow. And even just that amount there is enough for um, any bits of your body that are kind of like locked up and tight that that can help increase your circulation. Mm. And which includes and then what happens there is like your blood pressure can drop. So like your stress hormone and your cortisol goes down. But then you have a release of like happy neurotransmitters and dopamine. So all these things like just in a simple level happen mm. just from floating naked in salt water. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. But then there's how, layers how on top of that. The, in the, in the, to- in the tank for? The tank, yeah. 75 minutes is what we put for our session lengths. How? But like is there an alarm that sounds or? We play music. So when you come in, we give you like a full walkthrough. Um, I take it incredibly serious, like what, how we, um, you know, make sure that we guide people through their experience of what to expect and to ensure that they're like incredibly empowered and educated so that if they're in the float tank and they're like, I want to get out, that they know that that's totally okay, mm. that you can get out whenever you want and that's that's all up to you. Mm. Um, but so you shower beforehand, you float for 75 minutes, we have underwater transducers in the float tanks that plays music to let you know that your time's up. Play music, you get out, you shower again, and then we just have a lounge space that you can hang out in as well and just have some tea, some water, color, meditate, draw, whatever mm. works for you. Mm. But some people will book back-to-back floats and float for like three hours, three and a half hours at a time. Just staying there. Yep. 
Holy smoke. Do they come out then go back in or just stay in all the time uh, for the um, entire three hours? It depends. Some people have like gotten out to use the restroom and then back in again. Mm. But um, <clears throat> we had a woman who uh, we actually helped fundraise for her to get a tank at her home. But she would come in and just stay for the entire three and a half hours. To get what does she need a tank? Um, so she has this... Um, CR Crips, which is complex regional pain syndrome, which basically means that every single sensory input to her, like touch, is pain. Wow. So when she floats, since the water is the same as her skin surface, she doesn't feel any pain whatsoever. So when she would get into a float tank, she would repeat to herself, like, this is my normal, I'm perfect health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And by floating, it would, every 10, 10 days at that time, mm. was enough to, like, manage her day-to-day -day pain wow. so like normally she would like stub her toe she would be out for the entire day she'd have to lay down and she just would be in complete pain is this a um is this a condition that affects a lot of the population or it's, it's very small it's, it's it's rare um i believe that hers was brought on by a fall and then a concussion oh. um, but some people go to lengths of like they're in so much pain that they'll get induced into a coma mm. hoping that that's gonna like almost like re restart jump or the... restart their nervous system i guess Holy so that they come out again other people uh have amputated their like so if they have it like in their hands we'll get their hands amputated because the pain is so bad so wow. with her she's now floating i believe Every day for like an hour, and she's and living a regular the, life. The f oh, oh, you raised the tank. Yeah, we raised the money. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, we, wow. yeah, yeah. So how she's much is one tank? So, this is really amazing. So, we, um, there was a gentleman in Halifax, actually, like maybe in Bedford, who was like, My wife had one of these float tanks and she passed away. I'll give it to you for a dollar. So, what we did is we put them in touch and then raised money to help with the build for it. So, they probably completed it two years ago, and so she has a float. Flo float room in her own house in Turo. Wait, wait, wait. Back up. <laughs> so we, we, we took the float tank from the old guy's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Moved got, it. got it to Turo. So, like, um, there are things you had to do to a house to make sure the tank could fit, or? Yeah, and I mean, you want to have a shower right there because salt water everywhere is a pain in the butt. Um, you want to have a good um, uh, HVAC system because. Um, you really want to be able to control your temperature of your outside of the room, but also the inside of the tank. Um, things like that that just had to happen. You don't just put it in your garage and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, some people and may, but it doesn't work out so well. But. And so you have a system that sends water in and then takes it out? Or? Yeah, yeah. So there's our, ours has like a filtration and pump system um, that has uh, like a one micron bag filter a UV sterilization unit, the pump, and um, and then we all we just manually add our our like our chemicals and plant on enzymes and stuff to it. But uh, you know some of those are self-contained. This one that we got for them, everything is on the outside of the tank, which is actually easier to like fix and stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 great. Well, that's <laughs> cool. So um, what made you decide to do that? Like. Get the lady to tank. Uh, cause she needed it, and I felt really bad for someone driving from Truro once every week or, you know, two mm. weeks, and uh, I just saw her quality of life improving. And then, um, the third tank, I, you know, I at the time I don't know if I was ready for that at the time. I can't really remember, but I just knew that like she would benefit from it so let's help her out and uh and i mean her and her husband were so grateful for it and mm. um and the only thing that stinks about it is that we just don't get to see them as much anymore <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they'll come in just to say hi and to yeah. have like a quick float or whatever yeah, yeah, but yeah, for yeah, the yeah. most part uh you know it's kind of a bummer because we don't get to see them as that's much. super thoughtful what made you decide to call it i mean the name is pretty self-explanatory but yeah. what was your reason for making it so direct so, um honestly i wanted to call it um like maybe uh holocene um, health and wellness or something along those lines but a lot of Holocene people, so Holocene one it's a Bonnie Vera song but two the Holocene is the last period of like 10 to, I think it's 10 or 15,000 years of agriculture so um, mostly like how humans are 
living the way we are, this period of time is called the Holocene, and I really like that. But when I tested that with friends and family, they thought Whoa. it was stupid. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, to the Holocene. So frig those guys. But anyway, <laughs> so we just kept it as a flotation center, just kept it, again, direct. Um, I, there were certain things that I wanted to do that were very, like, it has to be this way because this is my space. And uh, I had to let go of that a little bit as well, too, mm. because how it's, it's not How difficult space. was that? Um, it took probably, actually, believe it or not, probably like a good solid two years of letting go of control. It always is letting go of control. Like I, um, and even just not even with the name, like even with, you know, micromanaging our team and stuff, like having to, realize that the flotation center is not just for, it's not for me it's for it's much bigger than that mm. so um it's always a learning process but now like here we are four years in i feel so much more better than where i was you know one year in where everything like i protected it like it was a baby mm. and now you realize that you have to kind of like let them let your let your baby go out into the world a mm. bit and maybe get roughed up and learn the hard <laughs> way. <laughs> um, and I mean, and how's flotation center going? Uh, how? Mm, no, that's not the question I want to ask. Personally, for you, uh, looking back four years now, right? Mm. Do you think you're where you want to be? Um. So the beginning of this year I made a conscious decision to just have a steady state year um, it's really easy I find to get caught up in you gotta hustle you gotta grow you gotta do you always gotta be moving and I realized that the flotation center isn't ready for any more growth right now so um, I'm learning to be okay with just where we are and, and I first I used to say like uh, being stagnant and it's like we're not stagnant it's just like just steady state even keel all the things that we did last year do again kind of this year um but after this year I'm going to look at kind of more and like of um look more into like what's next mm. um and what is next well, thank you. Fuck no. I don't know, man. It's funny because I like, do you, um, have you ever heard of that uh, website or app? It's called um, Notes from the Universe. No. It's, it's called Tut, tut.com. And what it is, is you get an email a day from the universe. But when you first sign up for the email, it, it talks to you about like, excuse me, setting like goals and, and dreams and. Mm. And so a couple of my goals were like having a cabin with a lush garden, but expanding the float center to help more people. And once in a while, they'll like incorporate your goal and dream into the daily email. So even today's was just, you know, Lindsay, just imagine how great it's going to feel when you've reached more people by expanding with the flotation center. And I, so I've, it's been on my mind in that like, I really believe that it, we need some research done on the benefits of flotation therapy. There's not really much going on in Canada, especially in the East Coast. So mm. ideally, I would like to <clears throat> expand to a bigger space, but to have a find funding for a more state-of-the-art float tank that you can get like equipment. Wait, wait, wait. So there are but like different levels of yeah, these Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So the float tanks I have, I mean... You know, when you're naked in the dark, it doesn't matter what the outside <laughs> of the float tank looks like. Like, it's just like, yep, here, here it is. <laughs> so it is. However, um, for example, down at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they have um, a probably a float tank that, you know, is a big circle that's wide open. That's probably as big as the center of this room. Um, and that's where they're doing all like their nerd stuff, but they're, they're watch like, you know, measuring blood cortisol level drops in real time and oh. stuff, right? So, and where we have Dalhousie Medical School and we have so many universities, like I just see the environment that flotation therapy creates as being this like really, um, specialized environment that like. I want the universities to take advantage of that. And mm. so I, I write to them all the time, but I get nothing back. But <laughs> I'm still going to try because yeah. I really believe 
in the simplicity of flotation therapy and mm. how, and how it works and that it's pharmaceutical free mm. and what it's doing for people but like you know, like anything like you know people want to see the science and it'd be nice to have some stuff done locally too mm. and plus even though i'm not an engineer anymore like yeah i still have the a med, little bit the of med that is in me. Like, oh, yeah. give me numbers give me yeah. numbers okay um so with the now with the center <clears throat> did you Okay, so you were saying actually I'm trying to put this the right way. <laughs> with with flu with floating, right? You know, it's 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 therapy in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you start floating as a form of therapy for you? Um, actually so it was it was given to me as a gift for mm -hmm. my birthday seven years ago. And um the person who gave it to me knew that floating helps with um getting into the meditative state and they knew that I had a meditation practice. So they thought, Oh, well, Lindsay meditate. She's going to like to float. Um, so that's how I first discovered it. But then, um, when I, and one of the reasons why I wanted it to exist in Halifax, but then when I started like going deep into the research of just like what it does for people and like mm -hmm. the science and the benefits, um, it really expanded my, my, uh, my thoughts on what it was doing for me. There was more, it was just a bigger umbrella basically. Mm. So, and most people who come in like on our waiver, we have like, why, why are you in? Most people just want to relax. And so sometimes for me, that's how floating is. It's just a way to relax without my phone around and just, yeah, relax, get naked in some salt water. <laughs> <laughs> And it's always advisable to look up, right? I yeah, I mean yeah, don't don't face float face down. <laughs> <laughs> you will not have a good time. <laughs> you floated before, though, didn't no? You, I, you know what? <laughs> yes, I have it, and I've not taken advantage of it. I know, you know. I think that was the next. Why question haven't was, you floated? That was exactly that's the next question I was going to ask. That I mean, I don't know if I'm claustrophobic, but just you know. I went there one day and I looked at those tanks and I'm thinking, I, I like my mind just went to the worst things. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, all the people who I know should flow. Like you're so busy. We've been friends now for a couple years and I will float. I will. You will. Float. I will float. <laughs> it, uh, uh. <laughs> and you know what though? Um, yeah. Also. It's going to find you at the time, like you'll, um, or, or you'll find floating at the time that you're meant to. Mm. And I really and truly believe in that. So just because you haven't, and we've been friends for a while, <laughs> like no big deal. But also <laughs> and, and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, saying things like that, that's that spirituality side of mm -hmm. you coming to for, has that always been like, or did something happen in your life to kickstart that? Um, my mom growing up, like I can recall her like being this kooky spiritual woman. Um, but we definitely, we grew up in the church, like Christians uh, going through United Church and all that stuff. But I uh, kind of fell out of that maybe when I was 18 or 19, just wasn't for me anymore. Um, but there was always was something there. Like I always was interested in like energy work and and reiki and meditation and and things like that and um even you know 10 years ago i wrote a list of like you know top blank things that are important to me mm. and one of them was always like finding a guru so there's always been that side to to me but definitely floating has helped deep in that mm. and the people who i've met through flotation therapy as well has like really expanded um the uh, what's what I'm looking for the potential you know for for my float sessions and to to share and to teach others too so mm. yeah. and did you find your guru yet <laughs> I'm told the guru is inside but <laughs> anyway yeah actually no last this time last year I was in Maui yeah at a, a retreat where I met who I would say is my like the guy I, Ram Das. So yeah, yeah, because yeah. because I always see that in most of your posts and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I love I love him. I love him. He's this really amazing, quirky spiritual teacher from back in the '60s who, you know, did a lot of like LSD experimentation of consciousness and things like that, and um, went to India where he met his guru Maharaji, his Maharaji, I guess, and. Uh, 
I've always loved that idea of just like someone who you are, um, I won't say like devoted to, but without any like clouds or over your eyes, like, you know, you're very aware. It's not this sickly, I've lost myself devotion, just like uh, something that's like bigger than you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you, and you know that it is good, you know? Um, so no guru yet, really. No, I because when I think about it, I also think it's like a one to one thing that you have someone that you is your guru that you see all the time. So it, like, that was what I was gonna yeah. ask you when you say you have a guru, like say this person, Ram Dass, yeah. Um, do you just call them or and see, that's the email thing. them <laughs> or like, go Hello. to the yeah um, to the uh, where they are? You know, um, people who I believe have. You know, like whether it's a spiritual or meditation guru or a confidant or whatever that may be, probably have a more one-to-one relationship on them, which is kind of what I would love to have. Mm. Um, I would sometimes say my therapist would be my guru, which Mm. is interesting. He's this little uh, uh, Hindu man who actually knows Ram Das and he follows... um, Yogananda, who is another, he's Yogananda, he's passed away, but he was responsible for bringing yoga to the Western world and stuff like that. Oh. So, so it's kind of cool that wait, I. Wait, wait, wait. If he's responsible for make, bringing yo, yo, yoga yep. to here, like, did he make a lot of money out of that? Um, actually, what is interesting is that I believe it was brought to California first mm. and he built a. Um, like a an ashram or a shrine or a learning center. Mm. However, one of the first people who really got into meditation and yoga um, was a major businessman back, a billionaire back in the day, who funded a lot of the pro- projects. Oh, yeah. So I mean, they lived quite like simple yeah, yeah, lives yeah. and stuff yeah, still, yeah. Um, but certainly you know. Yeah, got to make some money yeah. too. <laughs> but uh, it was funded through mostly donations. Oh, okay. And still, um, what Yogananda taught is, uh, you know, once a year, I think it's in August or July, that everyone from around the world flies to California for like this, you know, week long retreat. And stuff How like big that is too. this place? It's huge. Yeah, it has yeah. to be to take yeah. all. Holy smokes. And there's other centers across the world, I believe, as well. Oh, okay. Um, from maybe where he originally was from. So have you ever heard the book? Um, uh, shit. What was it? No, uh, biography of a books. Yogi? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, it's no. Out of, yeah, so um, the, what was his name? Um, Apple, the guy, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Uh, his favorite, the only book that he ever kept was Autobiography of a Yogi. Oh, wow. And uh, a lot of like life lessons and stuff, but that was written by, I believe, uh, I think his name was Pram- Pramashna, uh, Yogananda, his is the last name that he goes by. Oh, okay. But it's like that one book that everyone should read and st- I think Steve Biography Jobs. Biography of a, of of a, a Yogi. Thing? Yeah. Of and they're like, and they he gave it you know they gave it at his funeral and stuff like that. So. <laughs> oh okay. Yes. Oh wow. Deep shit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. And then the other aspects of you, I mean, shit. There's so many layers to you. But oh, what God. I want was uh, a couple of weeks ago you did the talk about weed. Mm. Uh, this thing, Ron, tell me a uh, bit more uh, about that. Um. Yeah. So that was really interesting. I've. Um. I was asked by the people at the coast if I wanted to be on a panel just to openly chat about cannabis and at first I felt like a little bit weird because I'm just a regular gal who smokes weed (laughs) (laughs) but um it's also been something that like it's been a part of my life for 20 years and that I've never um been I've never really shied away from it or hidden the fact that I did that which I understand is a lot of people don't have that that Mm -hmm. that same privilege I guess but I, yeah, it was just like a, a great panel just to chat about like our experiences with cannabis, good and bad, um, where we see that the industry is going and even just our daily practices and stuff as well. So mm-hmm. it was great. Um, everyone there was pretty stoned and I didn't because I was like sitting on the stage and I knew I'd be nervous and I wouldn't. I, I also like I know my limits <laughs> and I play within it. So I'm more of like an at home stoner (laughs) but it was uh it was excellent um really got to hear from a lot of awesome people like in the city as well who Mm. are doing some some good things yeah (laughs) do you 
Do you consume cannabis? I'm weird in that I no no yeah I'm 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 like here I've tried it yeah yeah but um here's the thing though the thing with me is that I always overdo things uh. so if I want to try something like if I'm gonna eat a donut it's gonna be like six or something <laughs> you know so so um the first time I tried it I overdid it yeah and everyone was like yeah you overdid it you know it should chill, chill and yeah. so so maybe but now it's legal maybe now i'm mm-hmm. gonna try because i overdid it and it wasn't a very good experience yeah. and so there's this part of me that every time is like do you want to relieve that really? <laughs> 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 but um and how do you feel about it when when you knew it was going to be legalized what, what was your thoughts on that um happy you know it's a it's a weird it's a scheduled to drug which like, why it, yeah exactly <laughs> but it just really goes to show um how well marketing and corporations and stuff are able to influence uh government and populations and things like that so you know the great thing about the internet is that we now have access to so much information at our fingertips mm. that we can see that you know back with reefer madness and i think it was like the 50s and the 60s that they were really just trying to paint this picture of how bad cannabis was for you and blah, mm. blah, 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 blah. Um, but now I, I like the potential for not just like for consumption, but for hemp products because it's durable, it's sustainable, it has a short growth cycle, it grows quite quickly, yeah. things like that. So um, I think now that with the legal the legalization, a lot of those barriers are going to fall down. Which is great for, you know, the economy. But also, uh, I like the idea that there's a lot of people who have been probably feeling a lot of shame that have been using cannabis maybe for medicinal reasons. Exactly. And now they're like, fuck all y'all. My, you know, it's always glaucoma or whatever. But like, you know, it's like, what do you you need? A a weed prescription? Oh, yeah, I'm a glaucoma. Right? Yeah, no, you're 14. You're fine. But but like, it's I I love that idea that now there's not going to be this cloud of shame around it like Mm. you know i know that i'm very lucky that i speak quite openly about a lot of the things in my life but there are a lot of folks who like my mom she uh, a couple years ago she kind of she broke her back like micro fractured it and the only thing that helped her was this weed oil that we put on and she's like i can't tell anyone about it and and then you know, she's just been skipping down the fucking streets like, we don't know the best. Oh, my gosh, this is amazing. But uh, it's those types. And, Mom, it's okay. <laughs> like, I, Sorry, she, just, she won't mind me saying that. But uh, uh, that's so liberating for yeah, folks, right? Like, yeah. And to live in shame for something like a plant. Yeah, right. You know, like, it's so, it seems so <sighs> trivial. But and nobody has ever been. died from it. Nobody, like, I know, you know what, say, say, say the experience I had was with, like, prescription drugs. Yeah. I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Because, because, yeah, it was You would have died, yeah. And that's another thing that, like, so, for example, the Nova Scotia College of Medical Doctors, they are really been told the last few years to cut back on writing prescriptions for things like opioids and, you know, focusing on more pro- proactive things. So, you know, even the fact that a lot of doctors are on the mm. side of like cannabis, especially CBD, which yeah. is the non psychoactive component, mm. um, it's awesome to hear to hear that because um, because it's such it's just a different way and non addictive way. Like Th- that's the thing about pain medicine. Yeah, it feels fucking good. I know. Here's the thing: I went, uh, I had my wisdom to pulled, mm-hmm. and you know, you are drugged up when that happens, so you don't feel it. And then they send you away with this thing in the yeah. yellow bottle, and they're like, "Take it when you need it or whatever, yeah. right?" And then whatever they gave you starts wearing out. Yeah. And then you're like, "Oh fuck, it hurts, it hurts." And then you take this thing. Swear to God, two minutes later, it's like. Holy shit. Yeah, who am I? Will someone <laughs> touch my face. <laughs> so, so I can't, you know, when when you have such an experience, you understand how easy it is yeah. to get addicted to this thing. Yeah. And then when you get a doctor that goes, oh, yeah, you know, I'm yeah. just going to refill this thing. It's easy to just fall into it. And I'm kind of happy that the family behind, especially Oxy, yeah. is facing what they are now. because They kind of, like, the guy, <laughs> I was reading his article and he he's just a dick. So I don't know too much about the family except for 
um, it was uh, just a big money making thing to do without worrying about the the consequences. Everybody right? in this family is a billionaire. Yeah. First off, um, so there was this guy. I think he's like uh, not a CEO, but really high up in the company. Yeah. He sent a memo out that was leaked, and it was saying that we can't be blamed for the people that are uh, getting addicted to yeah. this thing that you know is their fault they are bad people yeah. I'm like, the f- how do you even say that because oh uh, well I, I guess you know it's, you expect it's an internal memo and it won't go out but you know it got out yeah anyway i'm gonna end with this uh the wave what's the story behind the wave oh <laughs> <laughs> do you know what uh so um there's a line in a song by the band called the weaker thins that uh, says something like how I don't know what to do with my hands when I talk to you and how you don't know where to look, so you look at my hands. And so, like, I never know what to do with my hands. And so it just became this, like, thing like this. And um, and it got, uh, it kind of grew to be, like, this, um, like, awkward wave and I don't know what to do. But uh, a couple of years ago, I stopped shaving my underarms. I was just, like, so tired with with it. And I've spent thousands of dollars in, like, electric, like like hair removal and stuff but my sister was grossed out by it so I used to do it <laughs> and send it to her because she could not handle having like hairy underarms which just gross her out so there definitely was like another layer of it as well but then um it's kind of silly because it's just like people kind of caught on to it mm. and so I will get like messages of people just like the Lindsay wave hi yeah 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 <laughs> it's just fun to do okay so <laughs> I'm gonna end it with the Lindsay wave yeah thanks for coming thank you this is amazing thank you this is the blackout podcast listening.